Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the podium Lloyd Dean, the President and CEO of Catholic Healthcare West and the Chairman of the Bay Area Council. Hello, hello, hello. Uh, first of all, on behalf of the uh, Bay Area Council, I want to thank uh, the Governor for being uh, here with us. Uh, he's always informative, he's very uh, entertaining, entertaining, and certainly uh, very uh, driven. I also want to begin by thanking all of you for joining us uh, for this uh, Outlook uh, conference. Uh, this is my last conference as the chair of the Bay Area Council, which I've just uh, loved the opportunity not only to serve, but to work on behalf of uh, all of you. Uh, but what a way uh, to, to end as, we, as I uh, hand over the, the gavel to a very, very uh, excellent and seasoned uh, executive, uh, Janet Lampkin, uh, the president of the California uh, Bank of America. Uh, you will, you will just, uh, we will just be a huge beneficiary of her experience in her uh, leadership. Uh, but this is going to be fun. Uh, uh, I am about to introduce uh, two people who are well, well known uh, in this uh, nation. Uh, both have served uh, presidents uh, in the White House, and both of them currently counsel some of the top uh, businesses and clients uh, in this nation uh, around uh, uh, politically related uh, issues, but also uh, many, many, many of the uh, policy and business kinds of issues uh, that all of us uh, face uh, today. And the two individuals uh, uniquely uh, work for the same organization. I understand that they are totally uh, physically uh, separated uh, within uh, the corporation, but I think you'll see why in a moment. So now it's my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, two people that uh, you've heard of and certainly are well known throughout the United States. Uh, let me first uh, start and just tell you a little bit about Karen Hughes. Karen is the Global Vice President of Burson Marsteller, uh, and in that capacity, uh, advises business leaders on how to best strengthen their corporate reputations, achieve business goals through effective communication, and shape positive public and stakeholder perceptions. Previously, she served as the Undersecretary of State for Public uh, uh, Diplomacy, where she led the U.S. State Department's efforts to, to communicate America's values throughout the globe. Karen also served as counselor to President George Bush from 2000 to 2002. In that role, she acted as strategic advisor to the president on policy, on communications, and also managed the White House offices of communications, media affairs, speech writing, and press secretary. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a nice round of applause as she comes to the stage, Ms. Karen Hughes. Thank you so much, Lloyd. Thank Appreciate it. Thank you. Welcome. Thank, Thank you, you for being here. Hi. Now, on the blue side of the ring, <laughs> Mark Penn. Mark is the worldwide CEO also of Burson Marstella, and I've told you about the organization. But in addition to that, Mark is the CEO of Pinchon, a strategic research firm. He served as the key advisor in the 1996 re-election of Bill Clinton. He also served as a White House pollster for six years uh, and through a very, very uh, explosive and very interesting and challenging six years. In 2008, he was the chief strategist for Hillary Clinton. Mark is also well known as an author, particularly for his best-selling book. Many of you know this book entitled Microtrends. And Microtrends was a book that 
uh, focused on small changes uh, that uh, organizations and that uh, org organizations as well as uh, companies and individuals could have through uh, a, a very large impact uh, on our society. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Mark Penn. <laughs> now, as they say, it is uh, on. Uh, let me just start by setting the stage. As everybody knows, we've just uh, a few days ago uh, averted a government uh, shutdown. Uh, but no matter who you talk to, everybody says uh, that really was child's play uh, <laughs> as we look forward to the two ultimate looming uh, battles. The first battle is around the debt ceiling. Uh, all of us know that in just really literally a few weeks, we are going to reach the $14.3 trillion, if you will, uh, debt ceiling. And the big issue, uh, the battle that's looming, is will the ceiling be raised or will it not? And what are the implications for that? So, Karen, I'm going to start with you. Number one, do you think uh, that we're going to get a compromise on that? Do you think that that's a good thing? If we do, what do you think the Republicans are going to have to uh, give up uh, to get that done? What do you think they're going to demand? Well, I think the real onus is on the Democrats here because at the end of the day, uh, as Republicans and as Americans, we want to pay our bills. But at the end of the day, when you have a problem with debt, you cut up the credit cards. And, and that's what our government's going to have to do. There is no way that Republicans in the House will support any type of uh, extension, raising of the debt ceiling without significant deficit reduction, in, in my judgment. Um, and so I, I really feel that you're seeing the reality of that uh, played out in the newspaper headlines this morning. President Obama had previously said, even though he himself voted against raising the debt ceiling in 2006 and called it a failure of leadership that it got to that, now that it's on his watch, he sees it a little differently. Um, and he earlier had said that he would not allow any negotiations on any other issues, including deficit reduction. As part of that, this morning they're signaling in the newspaper that they are willing to consider deficit reduction, and I think we'll have to come out with some significant deficit reduction uh, because uh, Republican voters will not support Republican members of Congress who, who continue to kick the can down the road. Well, I want to hear uh, Mark's opinion. Mark, some are, are saying that the Republicans and the Tea Party, uh, that they are playing uh, with the world economy uh, and that uh, they are using this opportunity uh, to leverage an agenda, and that at risk is Armageddon. Armageddon. You've heard that, all of that. So, uh, from your uh, perspective, uh, what do you think is going to happen? What do you think the president's uh, willing uh, to give up? Uh, and how do you think he's going to maintain some of the uh, uh, program objectives that he has? under this kind of pressure? Well, you know, <clears throat> look, I, I, I think that the Republicans are still learning the lessons, paying the prices for the 1995 government shutdown. Uh, I think at that time, you know, we, we all predicted that if Gingrich shut down the government, it would reba rebound strongly and negatively <coughs> against the Republicans. And I think that's what happened. And I think everybody learned that lesson you don't shut down the government of the United States of America. <clears throat> now, you threaten to shut it down. You come to the last minute or the last hour because you can't go back to your caucuses and say, you know what, I didn't want to get down to the last minute. I didn't want to work till Friday at midnight. Uh, people have to give the impression that they've, they've gotten every last thing that they can get. So I think that the pattern here has been set. These things are going to come down to the wire. The tougher, the better, the truth of the matter is, the government shutdown experience actually softened everybody up in 96 to understand that negotiated and compromise resolution was a lot better than absolute abject and absolute confrontation. So it seems to me that's the mode we're in now, uh, that these things are going to be hard fought. Everybody's going to get their arguments out there. Uh, I think the debt ceiling has to be raised, so it will be raised. I think not raising the debt ceiling will just be seen as an obstructionist move that's the same thing as shutting the government down. 
Uh, I think the president is now, I think he was behind the conversation. I think he's now working to get ahead of the conversation. I think that's what his speech is going to be about. You know, how to start to deal with entitlement reform, how to deal with fiscal responsibility in a world where he inherited an economy that needed a stimulus to survive. But it's interesting, you, Mark notes that he's behind. I mean, I think tomorrow he's going to give a big speech that basically says, well, ignore what I said in my State of the Union and ignore what I said in my 2012 budget. Let's hit the reset budget. Let's hit the reset bu button. Now it's time to get serious about debt reduction when he's really, it's spent the last couple of years not de uh, dealing with that issue in a serious way. But I think, uh, fairly, he was behind, I think, the fiscal responsibility conversation. I think he's caught up on that. I think at the last minute he came in and he took appropriate charge of the conversation uh, and showed leadership, I think, in bringing this thing to an end. But remember, he had to, uh, he had to have a policy of holding up the economy or it would have collapsed completely. And I think he would say, look, I would have liked to have been fiscally responsible from day one. It wasn't possible. We had to save the economy first, begin to get it on track. We're beginning to have job creation, and now we can, we can afford to turn to the next job, next job and on the I, list. And I would argue that President Bush, in, in passing the un, very unpopular TARP funding, which has now been largely paid back to the American taxpayer, was what actually saved the economy, and that was a great gift to President Obama because he inherited an economy that was on the mend rather than one that was in free fall. Well, uh, I, I think I got the best job in the world so far, <laughs> don't I? Uh, uh, Karen, let me ask you uh, a question here. <laughs> Uh, the question is, who's running the House? Who's running the Republican Party? Who in the some, House? So, so, oh, oh, oh. Sorry. Some people say it's the new Tea Party group that's come in, uh, and they're saying that the traditional Republicans really have no control, but they're just uh, the face uh, out uh, front. Could you comment on that? Sure. I think Speaker Boehner is, is clearly leading the House and I think doing a very effective job. I think he showed that in successfully bringing the uh, budget uh, negotiations to a conclusion uh, last Friday night. That said, he has a difficult job to manage and it's not just because of the Tea Party. I like to say that we've seen two big populist uprisings in the country over the last several years. The first rose up to elect President Obama. People were tired of Republican leadership. They were ready for a change. They liked his rhetoric. They liked his idea that our politics could be higher and better. And so there was a populist movement that rose up and elected him. The second movement rose up in direct opposition to his, his policies, and that was the Tea Party. And I think it rose up because the people of America did not elect President Obama because of his political philosophy. They did not elect him to pass a $1 trillion stimulus and a massive health care uh, law uh, that, that has the, puts the government basically forcing Americans, making Americans health care decisions for them. And so I, I don't think that's why they elected President Obama. So the Tea Party is a genuine force, but it rose up from people and from, from their concern that the path we're on as a country is simply not sustainable. We cannot afford the, the type of debt, uh, the type of spending, uh, and, and the type of entitlement uh, costs that are, that are staring us in the face. And, and people fundamentally recognize that, and, and they think the path we're on is not sustainable. So that's where the Tea Party gets its energy. And, and it's a very difficult management job for the speaker to, to address the legitimate concerns of those members of Congress because they have to go home and explain to their constituents why they voted the way they did. Mark, the president, however, has said, uh, I don't want to move. Uh, I like uh, the White House. I've got uh, a lot uh, left on my agenda. Uh, so he has declared uh, that he is a candidate uh, for the next election. From your perspective, what will he have to do to win? And what is he going to have to give up to the Republicans to uh, get the necessary support uh, to guarantee that he returns to the White House? Well, I, I think actually I was surprised that Obama uh, announced this early. In 96 in the reelection, frankly, our, our whole objective was never to announce as a candidate, as a political candidate. It was always to be president first, and if somebody asked reluctantly, he was a political candidate, because the sense was you could do more from the bully pulpit as president 
and certainly reach out to nonpartisan voters much more effectively that way. I think he made a decision with the Tea Party, with the massive Republican money on the other side having been, having been poured into the 2010 elections, that they would get out early with fundraising. And frankly, I think he likes campaigning. Uh, and so I think he made a decision to be a candidate now and to lay it down early and to organize early. Maybe now, he's better at that than governing. <laughs> <laughs> Campaign, well, I mean. Well, <laughs> you know, it goes to what, you, what does he have to do to win? Well, to win a re-election, really this year is, is, is you running against yourself, or as I've said, shadow boxing against himself. He has to show that he can, you know, win and wind up the Libyan war. He has to show that he can come to some resolution on the fiscal matters and the budget. He has to show that he can take care of health care in the sense that is he moving forward? Is he retreating on some elements? Is he going to make some amendments to it and take that off the table? He also has to deal with taxes, which he should do in terms of tax reform. If he gets back into the discussion of is it tax cuts for the wealthy or not tax cuts for the wealthy, he did better than any other Democrat in you know, recorded his polling history among those people earning over $100,000, who are now 26% of the electorate. So he should have made the tax deal, I think, before the midterm elections, and having made it after, if he's going to do anything on taxes, it should be to make the whole system simpler, fairer, more effective, and to raise more revenue. That would be different from continually refighting this battle. So he's got to move to the center, he's got to show his presidential leadership, He's got to get the country on the right track. Hopefully, job growth will continue to improve and have ratings in about the 50, 55 percent level going into next year's State of the Union. Karen, uh, speaking of people running, <laughs> uh, let's talk about on the Republican uh, side. Uh, there is uh, quite a cast uh, that uh, we're all reading about in the media. Uh, maybe if you would uh, comment on the Trumpster. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, we all laugh, uh, <laughs> but there was a Gallup poll that said if the election was held today that he could probably garner 37, 35 to 37 percent of the vote. I'd love to hear your uh, comments on that. Uh, there are a lot of people asking the question, where's Sarah? Uh, I mean, is she still in Alaska? Where is she at? Uh, what's going on uh, there? Who do you see and think will emerge as a serious uh, candidate on the Republican side? And do you really think they can challenge the president? Well, I think the stage is set for a great philosophical debate in 2012, and that is not what we had, as I mentioned earlier, in 2008. I think in 2008 it was more a victory of, of, of rhetoric and a sense of change. But the stage is set for a great philosophical debate. My party, unfortunately, at this point doesn't know who our debater is going to be. Um, I, I, I do think, I, I'm not among those Republicans who are wringing my hands about this, however, because we have a history of sort of letting people take their turns. And sometimes that's had not such good results for us. So Bob Dole, it was his turn in 96, and yet he faced the younger generation, Bill Clinton, and same thing with John McCain in, in 2008, and the results of those weren't so good. So I actually think it will be good for the Republican Party to have a very healthy, vigorous debate. Um, my own sense is that because the 2008 election was viewed as a, a, a victory of rhetoric, that people will be looking toward results. And, and they'll be gravitate toward the leaders who have delivered in governing. Um, and so I think that speaks well for the many, many effective Republican governors that we have who are being mentioned as, as candidates. Uh, my friend Mitch Daniels, who sat next to me at senior staff meetings at the White House, who has extensive experience on budget issues, who was director of the Office of Management and Budget, has turned a, a deficit into a surplus in Indiana. Uh, my friend Haley Barber, who won great kudos for his management after Hurricane Katrina in uh, Mississippi. Um, Tim Pawlenty, the governor of Minnesota, again, just a very impressive candidate. I had a chance to hear from him in person for the first time not too long ago, and I was very impressed with him. So there, there are a number of effective, talented Republican governors who have produced results. Um, Mark and I were laughing backstage about Donald Trump. We, we can't imagine that the American people will hire someone who spent the last few years telling, you know, telling people they're fired. Um, but but there's, a, there's a serious point here, and that, that is, he had an opportunity 
to position himself as a uh, business leader a la Ross Perot, perhaps a, a somewhat eccentric one, but he could have perhaps repositioned himself. Instead, he chose to take on the, the issue of whether President Obama was really born in Hawaii, which, which from my point of view is, is not a serious issue. And so um, he, he missed that opportunity, I think, to define himself as a, a serious contender. Um, Sarah Palin's on Fox News. That's the last time I saw her. She, uh, um, she will, if she decides to run, she will be a factor. She has, enjoys a lot of popularity among, among many in the Republican Party. Um, but I don't know that she will decide to run, and, and she certainly hasn't made a lot of noise as if she is, is going to. Mark, in some of the pre of course, of course, let me just say that overall, I think Karen did a great job of sugarcoating the situation <laughs> the Republican Party's in. I mean, they've gone from a year of Sarah Palin to a year of Donald Trump leading the field. <laughs> I don't know. I suppose that's an improvement. <laughs> uh, Karen, I'll be back to you in a moment. Uh, but, uh, Mark, some of the early pre pollsters and pundits are saying that the best thing uh, that can happen to the president is exactly uh, what uh, was just referenced. That if Donald gets in there, hopefully Sarah will get in there and that out of every name that's currently come forward, uh, that all that's going to do is divide and conquer, and it will, ins will be a direct route to the president back to the White House. Do you agree with that? Does that make sense? Or do you think there will be somebody that will emerge out there, emerge that's a serious candidate, and if so, how does the president beat him? And who do you think well, that might, yeah. might but be? But that, that's where, look, you could always hope for a Goldwater-type election, but you can't count on it. I, I think that the, the, basic, the basic lesson is we don't know what the Republican Party is going to produce. The Republican Party is fractured. The, the Tea Party may have been partially a reaction to what was going on in the White House, but it sure was also a reaction to dissatisfaction within the Republican Party. So the party itself, I think, is reasonably fractured. The primary process has been switched and is unpredictable. They could get somebody to the right. They could get somebody unknown. Remember in 92, Bill Clinton, relatively unknown. A lot of, quote, big name Democrats didn't run. So anything can happen over there. Uh, and as likely anything will happen. Uh, but on the, on the other side, that's where, when you run a reelection, and I worked with President Clinton, I even worked with uh, Tony Blair in his third reelection, uh, which they still, which they have unlimited re-election in Britain if you could keep your office. Uh, it, in those elections, you run against yourself, right? You run against the mood of the country. So the number one thing right now, two-thirds of Americans are in a negative mood about the direction of the country. Very difficult to beat anybody unless you turn the mood around. Eight, you know, if you look at the unemployment numbers, you got to get it significantly below 8%. Right? So you have to have, I think as Karen said, some results on the economy, some results in the mood of the country. You have to have, I think, a clarity about what it is you want to do. So you have to have an agenda as vibrant, as important uh, for your next term as you had going into the first term, because all votes are about the future. Very few votes are really based on your past experience. They're about what will the president do in his second term. I do think that President Obama, and I forgot to answer the last, very last part of your uh, okay. question, I do think uh, that President Obama is vulnerable for some of the reasons Mark just mentioned, but also his approval, disapproval rating this week in Gallup was upside down, 46% disapproving of the job he's done, only 45% approving. Um, he, he, his only coherent foreign policy appears to be that he does not want America to play a leadership role in the world. Um, so I think he's very vulnerable there, even it, within his own party. You know, he, he ran against Hillary Clinton uh, because of his vote against the Iraq War, and now he's presiding over uh, additional military interventions. He's upped the stakes in Afghanistan, sent more troops in, which, by the way, I supported him on and think was the right thing to do. He's gone into Libya, so he's, he's got some discontent within his own party. Um, from, from, for some of the, he's endorsed the Bush administration uh, detention policies, which he ran against also. Guantanamo Bay is still you, open. I thought you'd approve of he's, it. I do. It's given the Obama housekeeping seal of approval on, on those policies, but, but he did campaign against those. And so I think that, that 
That doesn't mean that those on the left of the Democratic Party are, are going to support the Republican, but I think it does dampen enthusiasm on the left of the Democratic Party. On the other side, Republicans are enormously enthused, and so are independent voters. Uh, independent voters and Republicans do not like the health care plan, and I think despite Republicans' efforts in Congress, there will be efforts to uh, deny funding to the health care bill, there will be efforts to repeal and replace parts of it, but I think ultimately the American people are, are understand that the only way we're really going to appeal the, repeal the health care bill is to repeal the president and enact an, a new law under a new president after 2012. Yeah. Let me let me shift the discussion for a moment. We'll come back um, to the to to the, to the White House, uh, but this is a related question. Uh, do you think we should be in Libya? Well, as a personal opinion, I mean, uh, that, which I'm happy to give. But but look, I I think that that Libya is occupied by somebody who's you know had a dictatorial rule. He blew up a pan. You know he's. He's been engaged in terrorism. He blew up a Pan Am airliner. You know, he's, he's no, you know, obviously the entire world community thinks he shouldn't be running Iraq and that he's lost any legitimacy with his, with his own people. So do you think the president made the right decision to send troops into Libya? Well, he didn't send troops. I mean, to send, he sent air power, right? And so he, <coughs> the president, okay, I think, well, had, however the air power got right. there. Do you, think, <laughs> do you think that's a good thing, or no, I, was that a right decision? I, I think the president decision? made a correct decision uh, in a, uh, if, you, if you notice, actually, there was a full UN resolution. Uh, there were even Arab countries uh, that joined in with this. You had, I think, the French putting a substantial investment in this. And I think that, that he joined in as well in a situation where there were humanitarian aspects. And frankly, look, in addition to the humanitarian aspects, and I, and I think the president, I think, is careful in keeping the mission limited. The real goal, I think, is, is regime change at the end of the day. And at the end of the day, this is going to be judged on whether or not Libya passes from, uh, from Gaddafi's hands into a more stable, more rational government. I think that's exactly what's going on uh, across the board. Karen, the same question for you. Do you agree with Mark's perspective? I think the president unfortunately waited to act until it was so late that he got us into a very difficult situation now where his policy doesn't look as if it's going to be effective. Um, the, the, I saw yesterday or the day before the lead commander on the ground, not on the ground, but with, the, the NATO, with NATO on the air war saying that uh, basically he thinks he's got, you know, he's, he's entrenched at this point. So I think, I think he waited too long. It, when, when the rebels were advancing, when there was a moment in time when he could have acted and, and possibly gotten Qaddafi to step down, uh, the president didn't act. He hesitated and waited. Um, I saw our former ambassador to Iraq, Ryan Crocker, quoted as saying, you know you're too late when even the Arab League is ahead of you. Um, he, he, he just, you know, he, he, didn't, he didn't exert American leadership at the right time. I do think it was right to go help people who are standing up for their freedom against, as Mark said, a very, uh, a very brutal and, and repressive uh, dictator. <clears throat> Meanwhile, all of this dis discussion is going on, all of the debate is going on about you know, what's going to happen to the debt ceiling. From the average American's perspective, they're still deeply concerned about the economy. Uh, and even though there may be some positive uh, signs, uh, all polls say that uh, Americans still see that as the number one issue. And a majority of Americans uh, also are saying that they don't think uh, that they're seeing enough progress and enough attention being addressed to the economy. What do both of you believe has to be done to change that perspective in this country? I'll start with you, Mark. Well, <clears throat> look, I think the president's already doing what basically has to be done. He's put a strong emphasis on innovation. You know, he's working now, I think, you know, having turned from stimulus as the main economic policy, to I think we're going to have to see a, a, a fiscal discipline policy. He's turned after not initially really opening new markets. He's turned now to the trade agreements and opening new markets. 
So look, we, in order to succeed in this economy, we need investments in infrastructure and education, we need opening new markets, we need an emphasis on innovation, and we need fiscal discipline. And I think those are the key elements that you're now seeing emerge on his economic policy. And then ultimately, look, there's a lot of time between now and the election period to turn around the economy. I think with President Clinton in 96, again, from January to June, we almost 180 degrees turned around perceptions of the economy. And the economy itself really picked up steam. And I think if you look at the business cycle here, there's a pretty high likelihood that you'll see something similar, where the economy will really pick up steam, you know, going into the year of the election. Karen, your perspective. Well, I agree with, with Mark's policy prescriptions. Um, Mark and I are both free traders, and, and I'm glad to hear you're an advocate of fiscal discipline. Fair trade. <laughs> free and fair trade. The, um, but but I, I do, I do want to go to the heart of your question, and where you talked about people being really worried about the economy. This, I travel a lot around the country, and this is a time, and the last couple of years have been a time of enormous both anxiety and, I think, anger. Um, in, in the country. People are deeply worried. They, they feel the victim of forces beyond their control. They, they, you know, business, business is too big to fail, but some of them failed. And these complicated financial transactions that they can't even understand, but it decimated the value of their homes and of their retirement savings in many cases. So people are really, really anxious. And, and I think that's, um, that the unemployment rate is stubbornly, you know, 8.8%. I think for the first time in my lifetime, people, I'm 54, people my age are genuinely concerned that the country we leave for our children, you know, may not have as much opportunity for them as, as, the, as may not be as peaceful and prosperous as the one that we were fortunate uh, to, to live in. And so people, there's a really deep anxiety uh, across the country. I saw the mayor of Akron, Ohio quoted this morning in the newspaper saying that people are just generally in a very disagreeable mood. They're, they're mad at government. Um, they're worried. Uh, I think there's a fundamental concern about whether we have made the kind of investments in infrastructure to prepare. They're worried a lot of the jobs that have vanished may not be returning. And have we made the kind of preparation in education and training to prepare our workforce uh, and our young people for the jobs of the future. And so I, I agree that we are going to have to make some smart uh, innovation and infrastructure investments uh, to, to continue to be really competitive in, in the global economy. But that's why debt reduction is so critically important. And that's why I'm, I'm encouraged that there's a bipartisan effort, this, this group of six senators that are working on uh, on debt uh, reduction because we're not going to be able to make the kind of investments we need to make if we don't do something about uh, reducing the debt. Uh, <clears throat> let me just add one point to what Karen said because it's, we are in the longest period of sustained public discontent that, that I can recall through both Republican and Democratic administrations. Mm -hmm. So typically you've seen two years of discontent, it flips around, then it comes back, but, but actually, you're really looking at it almost since 9-11, even you know, a, a public believing that things in the world and the country moving in the wrong directions, essentially for a decade. That's a lot of pessimism against a public that has normally been optimistic. And it's a lot of pessimism towards established institutions, towards companies, towards the White House, towards Congress that has had a rating in the teens, you know, this is a time when, when not only tea parties, but I think you'll see more movements. You may see more growth of independent movements. You know, the, the voters are certainly unsettled. Look, I think Obama, you know, coming out of this, you know, has a uh, probably significantly better than even chance of re-election. And if you look at the Republican field, a, an even greater chance of re-election based on what you see so far. But it is an unsettled electorate. It is one that's been through a lot of pessimism. It's one that's still looking for the answers to America's problems. Thank you. Let me uh, now shift to some questions from uh, some of our uh, audience uh, members. Uh, both of you served in the White House, and you, both of you have served uh, different uh, presidents. Uh, the question is, if you could describe for the audience your best day in the White House, <laughs> and your worst day in the White House. We'll start with Karen. You want me to go? 
well, I guess I have to say the worst day was September 11th. Um, and d as a moment of aside, that um, the um, September 10th is my wedding anniversary. And so for that reason, I didn't travel with the president to Florida. I'd been scheduled to go. I didn't because I thought, well, my husband's moved all the way to Washington with me, moved across the country. I ought to be here for our wedding anniversary to at least be able to go to dinner with him. So I didn't. I sent my deputy to Florida. So I was actually in Washington when it happened, um, headed to represent the White House at a Habitat for Humanity event. And uh, so I was going to wear my blue jeans. So I wasn't in the West Wing because we didn't allow blue jeans in the West Wing. So. Long story short, the vice president ended up sending a military car for me. I'll never forget, you know, driving back into downtown Washington with every other car going the other way, um, getting to the uh, emergency bunker, which I was so, we were so new at the White House, we'd only been there seven months, I'd never seen it before, I didn't know where it was. Um, you know, I, I actually walked into the White House and no one was there. And I had to yell, hello, because I was afraid somebody would shoot me if I, you know, and, and literally the Secret Service came running around with their guns drawn, um, and they escorted me to the bunker, which, as you can imagine, was incredibly intense. Um, and just, you know, the, the, the sadness and horror that our country had been attacked in that way, but yet the determination that, that you know, we had to respond and figure out who had done this and, and uh, heal, you know, the country and, and get help to New York and, and to the Pentagon. And so it was just, as you can imagine, every day in the White House is intense. Um, somebody once told me that when I, when I went to work there that you'll, you'll never get an easy problem at the White House because the easy problems are all solved at the cabinet level. <laughs> Only the hard things come to the White House, and I think that's very true. Uh, I used to joke with my assistant about scheduling time for me to breathe because it's just so intense and there's so much, you know, so many issues, but, but that day was, was the most intense of all. Um, I think the, the, the best day that I can remember, and this, I, I just, I remember a couple of times, um, one was when they were decorating for Christmas, and it's beautiful. It's, it's like a winter fairyland. They, they do these beautiful Christmas decorations, and I remember once stepping into the Rose Garden and thinking, well, literally, you know, you, sometimes, sometime when you're around here, you've got to stop and take time to smell the roses and sort of pinch yourself and realize you know, what a privilege this all is to, to be here and to experience this wonderful place and, and to, to serve here. Uh, and so, I, you know, I think every day when you drive in, you have that feeling. But I can remember a couple of times, a couple of moments when we had great events, great state dinners with fireworks, and just times when it would, the, the fast pace would sort of stop for long enough to, to make me remember to appreciate it all. Well, I, <clears throat> I'd say as a member of the outside political team, who was there every day, uh, unquestionably the best day was when we, we were re-elected. Uh, and I think that uh, we were re-elected and, and able, I think, from the president to bring the country together, you know, around, you know, the balanced budget and the good economy. And the worst day uh, was probably when a news story broke about somebody whose name I'd never heard of before, Monica Lewinsky. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, now, I'm just reading these questions, uh, so I want to preface that. Uh, this is for you, Karen. Uh-oh. And, uh, and I have a light, a light question for uh, Mark. President Bush did not visit San Francisco once during his eight years as president. What's the real deal? Somebody asked me that earlier today, and I actually didn't realize that, because I, I think he was here during the campaign. I don't know. Um, uh, I, I don't know why that would have been the case. He, you know, they, they might, I was in the White House the first two years. Um, I don't recall ever hearing any discussion of, of course, after September 11th, we weren't really traveling as much. Um, and I was not, I, I came back for the reelection campaign. Um, and I think we probably didn't make, uh, too many stops in, you know, in, in real heavily democratic areas in the reelection campaign, but I, I really, I honestly don't know. Okay. Uh, Mark. Sorry he missed it. It's a beautiful city. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> uh, now, see, I wanted to ask her about uh, that look that George W. Bush had on his face when the Giants beat the team, um, <laughs> but I won't go there. Um, here's the question for you, uh, Mark. Uh, it's estimated that the president is going to raise over a billion dollars for his re-election. Do you really think that's fair? 
You know, I used to joke that uh, we spend more on advertising a hamburger than we spend on our presidential races. Uh, it's no longer true. We now spend more on presidential races than on our hamburgers. Uh, but do I think it's, it's fair? I look, I don't know if that, that figure has been thrown out uh, and who knows what's actually going to be raised. I think there's no question that there is more uh, political involvement by millions of people who never gave in politics before. And if the campaign does become a campaign of, of a tremendous amount of resources, it won't really be because of the big donors. It will, at the end of the day, be because of millions and millions of small donors who give $25, $50, or $100 and decide to participate in politics financially as well as with their votes. And I think that's changing. I originally did a, a, a survey of donors. I remember in the 96 campaign, uh, they finally found the list of donors. The, the median age of donors at that point was 74. There was absolutely no involvement in politics whatsoever. I think if you see the power of microtrends, if one or two percent, you know, get involved in politics and give $100, that alone generates $600 million, which means that this is going to be, you know, as, <coughs> as hard fought an election and a campaign as you're ever going to see. Okay. This is a question for uh, both of you. Uh, Karen, what this individual would like for you to do is to imagine for a moment, seriously, you are the top advisor to President Obama, and you could give him one piece of advice that you, will, you think will help him in his presidency. As that chief advisor, what would you say to him? I think he's got to tie, he, he's got to do a better job of not being buffeted by events and being relentlessly focused on jobs and economic growth. Okay. And Mark, you are the chief advisor to the top <coughs> Republican opponent mm -hmm. that will face the president. And the president wants to know, what do you see as my greatest weakness in terms of getting reelected, and what should I do about it? I'd say, Donald, time for new hair. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and <clears throat> look, after, after that, I'd say, you know, this election is about leadership. If you can show that you've got stronger leadership than President Obama has, you've got a shot. And if you can't, you don't. Let me uh, shift for a moment to health care. Uh, there is a great deal of focus by both parties now on two programs that are some of the largest expenditures that this nation makes in terms of cost. That one is Medicare, the other is Social Security. What do the two of you believe should be done relative to those two programs? I'll start with you, Karen. Well, that's the, <laughs> that's the, the, the third rail <coughs> question that has bedeviled you know, both parties for years. Um, I, I do think that um, the environment may be changing somewhat. President Bush, when he first in his first campaign talked about Social Security reform, a lot of people were very nervous about him bringing that up because, you know, Democrats for years beat Republicans by scaring seniors that we were taking away Social Security. But President Bush made a good faith effort to deal with the issue in his second term as president. It fell short, but he did bring it up, did try to do it. I think Paul Ryan got enormous credit last week for coming forward with a significant deficit reduction plan that would reduce $6 trillion off the debt over the next 10 years and would really change the way both Medicare and Medicaid are structured. Um, and I, I frankly think the reason President Obama is giving a speech tomorrow is because he lost that leadership point of view that's so important that Mark mentioned on this issue. He, he sort of lost control of that agenda. Paul Ryan got enormous credit for taking on this tough, these tough issues in a very serious way. I, I do hope that this, um, this gang of six that I mentioned earlier, which led by Senator Mark Warner, a Democrat from Virginia, 
and Senator Saxby Chambliss, a Republican from Georgia. They've got a plan that's in the works that they've been begin they, they haven't laid it out yet, but I think it is going to, it, it's based on some of the recommendations of President Obama's Deficit Reduction Commission, which he has not endorsed those recommendations, but, but this group has taken them on, has looked at them, and is, is supposed to be developing a plan for about $4 trillion in reductions uh, in, in those programs. Um, for Social Security, I, I think there are going to have to be some changes that reflect the fact that the demographics of our country are changing. The, the um, people work longer now, people are retiring later, people are living longer in retirement. And so we're going to have to look at all those factors as we address the issue of Social Security. Well, <clears throat> I think the important thing now is for the President to keep everything on the table and everybody at the table. That, that you know, these things, look, they're a grand bargain. The President is not going to sacrifice the values that this country needs to have Social Security, needs to have Medicare, needs to have retirement and, a, and appropriate health care for its aging population. That's not going to change. No Democratic President is going to back off that, neither should he. Now, having said that, He's got to look at the proposals for the funding and finances of those things as demographics change, as the finances change, uh, exactly as was done in the previous balanced budget deal that actually, if you go back, two years later resulted in a balanced budget that nobody expected would happen. Okay. So never get overdone with economic projections that 40 years out never happened on the one hand, and so don't kill the programs because of it. On the other hand, I think the President's got to lead a very rational process and debate on this. Final question. We've got about uh, 60 seconds, so I'm going to give you each uh, 30 second response. Some observers uh, are saying that uh, when one party recently had both houses, both uh, uh, houses, we didn't get anything done. Uh, when now one party has the House, one party has the Senate, it doesn't seem like we're getting much done. What's it going to take to get something done in this country from the public's point of view? Well, it's interesting. <laughs> I, I did a poll about a year ago on this topic. I said, you know, the public, they, they're really fed up with inaction, and so they probably want to get rid of all the checks and balances and maybe have a parliamentary system. And the poll came back, absolutely not. They like the checks and balances. I said, well, do you want to give the president more power to get things done? They said, absolutely not. Do you want to lengthen the, the term of people in Congress so we wouldn't have elections all the time? They could get more done. Absolutely not. So then I finally said, well, what did you want to do? They wanted to have uh, elections on the Supreme Court judges. They wanted to have term limits. They wanted to have national referenda. They wanted to have nonpartisan primaries. Right. I think they wanted to have California. <laughs> well, they can't have California. Karen? I basically think people like checks and balances, and I think we're going to see, I think we saw in the, in, people were rolling their eyes last Friday night as we approached the deadline for a government shutdown, but in the end, uh, Speaker Boehner, Majority Leader Reid, the President got together and, and worked it out, and I think that's going to happen, and it's going to have to happen on some issues like raising the debt ceiling in the coming months. Thank you. On behalf of the Bay Area Council, want to thank you, Mark, and want to thank you, thank you. Uh, Karen. Thank you very much very much and one th one thing that we know is that we will be able to affirm uh, very shortly whether your predictions were accurate <laughs> or not so thank you very much thank, thank you. you so much thank you